So the other day, I was just sitting in my office simply because I have no life and I never leave this place. But I came up with a pretty interesting idea. What is the highest win rate opening in chess? So I started by doing what every chess professional would, which is procrastinate. But then I came back with a plan. So for the first step, we need to access all the statistics about chess. I know this may sound intimidating at first, but the only thing that you need to do is type in leeches.org. Now we need to click on tools, analysis board, click onto the little book. And in order to get relevant statistics for your rating, we need to click onto player, make sure all the games are selected and now you're pretty much uh, good to go. Now you have access to all the chess statistics without even having to create an account. Now the next step is pretty simple. We just need to look through the statistics and pick the highest win rate. So I did exactly that, but when I noticed that pretty much all the statistics are roughly around 50%. I felt like we may be trying to find the needle in a haystack. But after doing some serious digging, I think I just discovered a mind-blowing idea. So we're gonna open up the game with e4 simply because it's the most common move and now we will be following the most established path. Black goes e5 and now I realize that funnily enough the highest win rate move is to actually play f4 leading to the starting position for the king's gambit. Following the statistics, black will normally accept. Now white can choose between knight f3 or bishop to c4, but when I noticed the following idea, that left me completely speechless, since after knight to f3, pawn to g5, bishop to c4, black normally goes for the aggressive pawn push, attacking our knight, where white is supposed to completely ignore this by castling. And after pawn takes on f3, queen takes on f3, threatening to take, and then put pressure on f7, will generally force them to play the move queen to f6 where instead of following the most common move which seems to be pawn to c3 i recommend you go for the aggressive e5 already securing a win rate of 59 percent now it is not completely obvious why uh, white is sacrificing this pawn since rook e1 trapping the enemy queen is not available but here it's where the tricky part comes in because we're gonna go bishop takes on f7 followed by pawn to d4, leading to some of the most fascinating variations that I have ever seen. I have to say this looks a little bit too good to be true, so the next step was to check whether this is any good, objectively speaking. So for that I had to open up Chessbase, turn on the engine, log into a cloud server, and run some of the strongest computers out there in order to get the most precise analysis. But I started immediately regretting since I noticed Stockfish thinks black is completely winning. At this point, I just felt empty. I knew I just had to move on. So I had one last idea left. I tried understanding why black is winning and whether any human can recreate this. And the moves did not seem intuitive at all. They are supposed to find the move queen to f5. And not only that, after bishop takes on f4, knight f6, and now the very tricky queen to e2, creating a monster threat of bishop to e5, taking advantage of the pin. According to Stockfish, Black needs to sacrifice a full rook by playing the move queen to g4, simply ignoring takes, takes, bishop to e5, discovery, king to g8, and then we just get to take the rook. Please notice that they are unable to take the bishop because white is completely winning after rook f8 and rook c8. So instead, black just needs to play around the bishop for a little bit with a rather complicated position, in my opinion. In fact, if you ever get somebody playing queen to f5 against you, they are more likely that instead of queen to g4 sacrificing the rook, they would try to play the more cautious queen to e6, where after bishop to e5, bishop g7, knight to c3, followed by knight to e4, creating multiple threats, while it is at least not worse while keeping a dangerous attack against the enemy king. Maybe this is not the end of the world after all. But what I find to be even more fascinating is that if we go back, instead of uh, queen to f5, which they seem to play around only 20% according to the statistics, they will more often go for queen takes on d4, playing the greedy approach which can immediately backfire. Take a look onto this variation. We're gonna be blocking the check by gaining a tempo with bishop to e3 saying hello to the enemy queen, highlighting the fact that they're unable to take because hello, there is a pin, white is winning. And instead, they will generally go back with the queen onto f6. 
Now, after queen to f6, white is getting an overwhelming initiative, starting with knight to c3, creating a monster threat of landing the knight in the center. Please notice that the bishop is still immortal, since that would allow a check on any square, followed by rook capturing the enemy queen. So instead of this, c6 would be smarter, but after knight e4, notice that the enemy queen is running out of squares. Okay, like they really need to keep defense over the f4 pawn. Playing a careless move such as queen takes on b2 would be similar to resignation after queen takes on f4, picking up the f8 bishop next. So instead of this, better would be queen to f5 where feel free to pause the video. White has a completely crushing move and it is not very often that we use pawns in the attack. And here g4 seals the deal, deflecting the enemy queen, queen e5, loses after bishop takes on f4, followed by some deadly discoveries. And notice that if you go for the ampasson, well, the queen remains undefended, so that wouldn't help either. Therefore, after the move pawn to g4, white is completely winning as queen takes on f4, followed by picking up the bishop is unstoppable. Not too shabby. Now one last trick where people seem to lose incredibly fast is that uh, after the stunning bishop to e3, they would even go for the greedy queen takes on b2, immediately losing after queen takes on f4 check. Please notice that blocking with the queen would get you on the same nasty file, and there is simply a move such as queen to c4 check, and then picking up the queen, and uh, nor knight f6 helps because after the simple bishop to d4, Defending the rook by the x-rays, attacking the enemy queen, attacking the enemy knight, white is completely winning. So to sum things up, is this gambit slightly dubious? Well, we can both agree that uh, it is very risky, but as the statistics uh, show up, it is completely worth it. And it seems to be one of those very good scenarios where we just have to ignore what the computer says. So there you go. Here you have the... Highest win rate opening for white. Love it or hate it, you cannot really argue with the statistics, can you? So make sure to have these lines into your pocket. You can even use the Leecher study for free. I will link that in the description. And for the next part of the video, I'm going to be walking you through three model games that I played against intermediate players, showcasing what to do in case black avoids this kind of complicated lines. And I don't want you to see this as only a King's Gambit video. Even though, yes, that is the main focus, I think the most valuable lesson that you can learn is how to think outside the box and come up with the best move in pretty much any position that you play. It won't happen overnight, but I promise if you keep watching, you will improve. Right, everybody managed to get another white game. Let's open it up with uh, e4 and uh, all right, time to go for the uh, king's gambit. And uh, let's see if opponent is going to be surprised by this at all or not. This far, we see the uh, accepted variation, just going to be playing uh, knight f3. Important to be aware of this uh, check that could potentially uh, just be a pain in the ass. So. Uh, I'd much rather not allow it, and uh, okay. We see the knight uh, developing to c6. As candidate moves, I got d4, I got bishop c4. Um, yeah, I think we will start with d4. Just uh, threatening to take, and uh, only critical move is now g5. He plays the move d5 though, which actually if you are playing in this rating range, uh, I did a little bit of uh, study before uh, making this video and I realized that this is super common uh, according to the statistics, which, uh, hey, the good news is that this is just a bad move because you can take. Now, the main reason why taking is so kind of like devastating is that knight to c3 is pretty much forcing the enemy queen to leave immediately. Best move would be bishop to b4, but yet again, quite often they check, which is terrible. Or they go back. Now, you can go ahead, uh, please feel free to pause the video and uh, find uh, the best uh, move for y that is uh, leading to a large advantage. Because, well, the whole point is that we can uh, completely undermine uh, black's position with uh, the move d5. I do believe at this point uh, white has... A crashing position as early as move 7, so facing 1600 rated opponent in rapid, not too shabby. So, 
expecting either like knight b8, knight e7, I guess against both I'm gonna recapture the pawn and uh, we're just having um, tremendous lead in development. We got like three pieces developed, a pawn in the center, he had nothing. Okay, and now it just develops. Uh, we could take, I could play queen d2. I find that to be a little bit more natural, just kind of getting ready to take, preparing to castle, and against check we can simply block with a bishop. So, just trying to keep up the uh, leading development, and hopefully, uh, that's gonna allow us to transition into some kind of an attack. Because if we don't make uh, any use of the leading development, it uh, it's something that can uh, evaporate very easily. We just have a dynamic advantage. So, uh, okay, knight to f6. I guess checking is an option. Not sure how uh, and what <laughs> do we gain from it. Not sure at all. Um, so I'm just considering long castle. He's probably gonna short castle. And then the interesting part begins. How do we attack? I think we need to develop the bishop, and d3 seems to be a rather um, natural square. I mean, where else can we develop the bishop? Simply setting up a little bait. If he takes and then takes the pawn on d5, you pause the video and uh, find uh, the winning sequence because we can um, take the knight, and after queen takes, there is this little discovery. Bishop takes on h7, king takes, and then uh, the rook uh, picks up... Uh, the enemy queen at the end of the variation. Will he actually fall for it? That's a huge blunder. He should not be playing that. Hopefully he plays uh, something more like solid. I think a solid move for him would perhaps be queen d6. Just trying to kind of minimize the damage and uh, look for an end game. But I think the end game is already much worse for him. Just because of uh, such a huge uh, lead in development that we already have. I mean... Every single one of my pieces is developed. I have castle. Well, look at him. Okay, all these pieces are on the last rank. Like, he literally has only one knight that is not on the back rank. All of his pieces are uh, just so passive. And now this block uh, blocks the bishop. Okay. How do we come up with uh, the best move? So, first of all, um, you want to be looking for an attack. Okay, what tells you you should be looking for an attack? Well, uh... We have uh, opposite castles. So generally when uh, you notice there are castles on uh, opposite sides, it's usually a race. It's about who is attacking faster that usually wins. Now we can either start uh, attacking with pieces or with pawns. Like for instance, attack by pieces would be knight g5 and then maybe queen h4. Notice that he could sort of easily dodge that with h6. So I'm not sure how interesting that is and uh, we can uh, sort of... Postpone that for the moment, and then uh, the remaining moves are, uh, okay, attacking with pawns. So, either g4 or h4. Now, g4 makes more sense in this position, because, uh, well, h4 is a bit slow. Like, in order to do anything, you need to re push the pawn all the way to h6. And with g4, if you play g5, potentially we're getting rid of this knight, and then maybe some sacrificial ideas could uh, come in pretty handy. Uh, maybe we, let's say, get rid of the knight and then play knight e4. So that's uh, a move that's very tempting for uh, for us. Additionally, we could play a central move, like rook e1. Just rook on the open file and try to play simple chess. Besides that, okay, only kind of last sensible candidate in the position. Actually, I just saw another one besides that, but d6. I would slightly consider d6. Maybe we can open it up in such fashion that... Uh, we can just uh, brutalize him in the center. But then, I realized, okay, c7 square kind of likes uh, protection, don't you feel like? And I'm just like having a quick glance over knight b5. Now, the issue with knight b5 is that it leaves the pawn undefended and he can take with a knight. And at first, this would look like a no-no. Like he's attacking our queen, he's defending c7, right? But after knight b5, knight takes on d5. How about bishop takes on h7? King takes on h7 and then the rook takes on d5. 
Now, pawns are even, we're threatening to take. And he could potentially defend that by playing c6, which is apparently a double attack. But then, uh, what if we go for something like uh, maybe knight g5 or rook h5 check? Um, he's going to go back. And then we go queen to h4. And notice that he cannot play uh, knight f6, defending h7, because uh, the knight is pinned and the queen would be lost. So I think knight b5 is the killer move. Even though I was about to play g4, which is kind of like an okay move, I just noticed that uh, sort of instantly uh, we can take advantage of uh, the fact that uh, he just has no way to defend on, uh, on c7. So you just want to kind of scan the board real quick. Yeah, like you think, okay, from like a theoretical uh, point of view, opposite castles means we should go for the attack. Now, why the heck do we attack him on the other side of the board? Well, you just noticed the uh, concrete calculation that we did, which just beats, uh, beats everything. Yeah. So in case uh, we wouldn't be able to find the move knight b5, let's see, you just miss it. Then if you just play g4, you're still better. But uh, you always want to double check. And he just plays knight to c5. Ignoring that. Now, in case of c6, I guess we would have had uh, easy play. Probably takes. And then infiltrate with the knight. I think that would have uh, been a big advantage. And uh, knight to c5. Okay, just gonna follow it up uh, as we wanted. Can he go for any tricks, like let's say trying to get rid of my queen? After knight c5, let's say try something such as knight h5. I don't think that should be scary, simply a move like maybe queen e5, hitting the knight while keeping everything defended, so I'm just gonna play it. Knight d3, simple move, rook d3, so. Extra pawn, I assume he has to play rook to b8, but then, uh, yeah, notice that the rook on b8 is kind of uh, sitting dangerously uh, on the x-rays. So rook to b8, I'm not super sure of, to put it mildly. <laughs> uh, I guess rook b8 only move. Yet again, knight h5, queen e5 seems very strong, targeting the knight uh, and keeping everything defended. And on rook b8, First things first, I'm looking double attack, okay, knight e6. Hitting this, and then opening up uh, queen's path towards the enemy rook. But then, instead of pawn takes, that's kind of nice, winning exchange, he could go uh, bishop takes, and now the queen is protecting the rook. So because of that, best move would be pawn takes, targeting the queen. Let's say the queen has to move somewhere, let's just say a5. Then maybe we have e7. So let's say he plays like a safer queen e7. We can take. Takes to the queen. We got an extra pawn, but uh, the position opens up. It's not very clear. So I think knight e6 is helping him develop. I don't think we should play that. Still, opponent has absolutely no threats. So I could just, uh, you know, play like a d6 move. Cementing the knight forever, which I really like. And if you, let's say, pause for a second and uh, you ask yourself, how is he going to develop this bishop? He'll probably go to g4, where knight e5 could be very annoying. But then bishop h5, bishop g6 still somewhat surviving. So maybe just playing uh, h3, just to be ultra annoying. <laughs> That's such a such an evil move. Like the bishop only square now it's d7, but d7 is completely pointless. Then we can go uh, d6. Knight e5, uh, do not forget that uh, lets the knight uh, undefended. So I'm just going to play d6 now. I could also uh, spend a moment and bring rook on the open file. Do I want to bring rook on the open file? Like according to the rules, that would make sense. I can also play c4. Kind of wants rook c8, so I think I'm just going to start by cementing my position. And uh, if bishop c6, just knight e5. I don't mind bishop g2, that's opening a uh, file for the attack. That's a really poison pawn. <laughs> it's going to get him instantly uh, regretting. And uh, yeah, 
Next up, I think I want to do something like knight d5 and notice that perhaps this rook is going to come to d1 over protecting d6 and the other rook from the third rank with the rook lift. But gotta watch out for uh, knight h5 forking ideas. Don't want to get forked. Uh, so I think this kind of uh, no matter what is going to happen. At this point, when we have such a strong asset as the d-pawn, we may very well uh, just win by <laughs> advancing the pawn and uh, we may uh, not need to play it for the attack. And he goes 98, which makes absolutely no threat because taking is uh, leading to a disaster for him. I could go rookie one with idea to infiltrate and squeeze even more. I think I quite like that idea. 95, uh, definitely move to be considered. I think uh, many moves are good in this position. I don't know why I'm talking like that, but I'm just going to bring a rook. I feel like bringing rook is, uh, you know, bringing as many pieces as we can. Maybe then 95, maybe then rook e7. Like 97 takes and then we promote, so I don't care about uh, queen e7 in that variation. And uh, Okay, I mean, this is pretty much a position where we have uh, full control. It's just a matter of uh, not losing the full control. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, G6, okay, just gonna infiltrate saying, oh, oh no, I blundered. Knight C7, he can take me. But no, then we get to take twice and we promote. So not only we win back the rook, we're winning two rooks. So uh, two rooks is uh, double than one rook. Um, that should be pretty good. That's how you win games. This is the quality advice that you came here for. Anyways, besides that, this becomes a thing now. Because rook 8 all of a sudden, queen f7 will be uh, made next. And after 98, the bishop takes, maybe queen f6. Just uh, getting into those very juicy dark squares. Oh man, that is just... Uh... <laughs> That's feeling like such a warm place. It's just like you know, get a very nice uh, hotel room and uh, you got uh, the best uh, view. Literally <laughs> inside the opponent's house. Uh, it feels like at this point we're just spying on him. It shouldn't be fair. Like you take queen e8 and then you play queen f6. Imagine a knight lands on h6. That is just brutal. Also, perhaps even stronger, we take and then we play queen h6 creating deadly threat of knight g5, mating on h7 because f6 is never a thing as that opens up the 7th. And once the 7th rank is open, then queen g7 uh, or queen h7 is a thing. So yeah, I think he's uh, pretty much uh, lacking any counterplay that I can see at least. Uh, but uh, he'll definitely try to come up with something. And okay, bishop to f5. So counterattack. Can we sack queen? No. Can we ignore and play queen h6? Oh, I think we have to go for that. So queen h6, he takes. I'm going to go knight g5, and then he's going to go knight f6, defending. But then I'm going to go knight d5, deflecting. Wow, that's so beautiful. Also, bishop takes on d3, knight takes on e8. I think kind of ends the game regardless, but it's even beautiful to go. Bishop d3. Oh, you know what? There's something even better. This is so good. Bishop takes on d3. I found even a prettier win. This is just ridiculous. Opponent may report me for cheating if we play the next move. So this was pretty enough. Knight f6, 95. But I'm looking even 96 right away. How do you defend? <laughs> Queen takes on f8. Huge flat. Move the knight. Get mated on g7. No checks. Now, knight e6, he could go queen e7, but then after pawn takes, I'm threatening to promote and... Ah, this is too good. This is just too good. Look at this. Look at this beauty. If pawn takes, that's a mate. If queen takes, we take. And then we promote with mate. King's Gambit, I just uh, can't add more to these variations. 
this is what you can get if you're playing the King's Gambit. One of the most uh, underrated uh, weapons uh, against E5. If you are, uh, let's say, more of a casual player uh, below uh, 2000 online. Thing with King King's Gambit above like 2000 is that uh, they just learn the theory and um, it's just an equal game. It's not really leading to very fun positions. But as I told you in the beginning, I did my fair share of research and I noticed they play this uh, dubious variation quite often. And now that makes nothing but clearing the seventh rank. And then we made. Oh my, arguably one of the nicest King's Ending Gambit uh, games that I have ever played. Just look at this beauty. Now, if Queen E7 pawn takes, if you move the knight, this is mate. If you don't move the knight, this is mate. How beautiful. Yeah, and... How strong was H3? I'm like really curious. H3 actually, you know what? Third move according to the engine? Not bad. Not bad. I'll uh, just uh, let me tap myself on the back for that. I think that was hardest move of the game, playing H3. Also, is knight b5 best in that position? Yeah, I think knight b5 is uh, close to best move. It's like many ideas, but as you can see, knight b5 uh, very... <laughs> far up there at the top I think knight b5 is just killer move there could have defended better but yeah after this I think uh, conversion was very much uh, on point rook e1 brings a rook queen h6 and then knight e6 as I said knight g5 knight f6 knight e5 would have done the job just fine deflecting and then there is mate he, it's unstoppable but knight e6 you have to recognize it was even uh, nicer. So, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. All right, everybody managed to get a game with the white pieces. And this time, we're going to be seeking for a very aggressive play. Because on E5, we are going to be playing uh, the King's Gambit. Okay? King's Gambit. This gives pretty romantic vibes. And uh, it is definitely, I would say quite an underrated opening, especially uh, if you find yourself in the rating range below 2000 online. The thing with the King's Gambit is that if black is really well booked up, it is maybe not the greatest opening, but uh, I just think the surprise value and uh, the fact that it's quite tricky for black to handle these type of positions uh, could potentially give you a great edge if you're looking to spice things up uh, in your life against e5. Now, opponent plays bishop to c5, which is a very respectable move uh, because it's, first of all, setting up quite a nasty trap because a lot of people uh, that are just getting started with the king's gambit may fall for the temptation by playing pawn takes on e5 where all of a sudden black is instantly winning. Queen to h4 check. If you go g3, queen takes on e4. We just, uh, yeah creating a big fork and uh, pretty much you're going to be losing the game. So instead, you got to play the move knight f3. You got to really watch out for this little idea. And now I'm expecting him to play d6. And after he plays d6, uh, I do believe uh, we have a choice. There is uh, c3 as a potential move in this position, preparing d4. We could also play uh, the move bishop c4 and then uh, d3. I could also play uh, a move such as uh, knight to c3. Here again, I uh, cannot uh, take twice because uh, I believe queen to d4 in this position is annoying. Not to mention uh, the same, like queen h4 at least uh, kind of achieves the same. Perhaps that's even better. So, yeah. I do recall uh, one of my old games uh, in this structure. And uh, I think I'm just going to start with a pretty uh, forceful play in the center because the issue with bishop c4 type of line is that uh, well we're gonna have a hard time castling so against this i'm gonna play c3 simple plan go d4 next curious to see what my opponent is gonna go and okay he does go in uh, for the bishop 
which is a move that I was considering uh, and I find it pretty sensible because I guess the main point is that if we go d4, he may try to throw in bishop takes on f3. And if we take back with the queen, notice that the queen loses control with the d4 square. And then uh, he can potentially win a pawn by going e takes on d4. Meaning that uh, we'll have to s sort of turn this into a gambit. Uh, do I really hate uh, turning this into a gambit? I mean, I can also play h3, forcing bishop takes, and then we take with a queen. I'm saying forcing bishop takes because bishop h5 obviously would get the bishop trap. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna start with this and notice that I'm not being bothered by queen to h4 check at all because I have a simple move such as g3. So uh, yeah, queen to h4. Typical beginner mistake. Uh, if he was not uh, playing that, then let's say he would have made a more normal move like knight c6. I guess I would have really considered even bishop to b5 because I feel like uh, potentially doubling his pawns and then sort of fighting for uh, the d4 square uh, maybe in the future push. Um, honestly, I think it's a matter of preference. I think knight c6 bishop b5 or bishop c4 should be fine and then d3 bishop e3. Knight d2, castle shot, I think white has very easy game. But yeah, when he checks, I have simple move g3. So this is not really a problem. Now he goes back to e7. And uh, okay, how do we play this? It's a bit funny because we have no pieces uh, developed, it seems. We have only moved pawns. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, it's mainly bishop c4, bishop b5. Perhaps slightly considering bishop g2, not the serious though, because the bishop's kind of uh, passive uh, for now. Uh, but yeah, I told you I would ideally like to pin the knight, but just because the knight is not there, uh, that's not a thing. Like, it's pointless to check because he can just play c6. It's not like he's forced to develop the knight. So I think I'm just going to do this instead, and I have the simple plan of going d3. Ideally, castle. Castle is illegal move because of the bishop covering this diagonal. So I have to play d3 and then bishop e3. Make sure uh, we get rid of uh, that bishop and then, uh, yeah, do this. Castle when possible. Knight goes to d2 because the natural square is taken and placing the knight on the edge of the board is kind of weird. I don't really know why would you do that. And yeah, just pretty much trying to develop. Bishop e3 would be the reflex move here. I could also somewhat consider f5, maybe just kind of like um, sort of closing down the position and in case he castles, we may be able to create a monster attack with a move like g4, even though we are kind of uh, slightly behind in development. Uh, that's a move. I could also consider taking space before bishop b6, a4. Maybe a5, b5, hit the knight, yeah, honestly, I don't think it hurts here to grab a little bit of space. Just trying to get that uh, kind of like nice squeeze on uh, both sides uh, of the board. Uh, funnily enough, this is quite a nice little uh, thing that I believe a lot of the Soviets players do quite well. Uh, I've, um, I've read in books and noticed that usually the top uh, Russian grandmasters have this kind of uh, style of preferring the uh, squeeze on both flanks if possible. Uh, so yeah, I think it makes sense to just go all the way here, play a5, uh, a little bit uh, resembling a Jubava London idea if you guys uh, ever watched the channel uh, for me playing that. Uh, and uh, now basically what we accomplished with this, maybe the rook could infiltrate if, uh, if needed. So I could play bishop... Uh, e3, I could also play knight d2, delay that for a little. When I'm going for f5, the only thing that kind of bothers me is whether he can play d5 in under good conditions, but because both my queen and the bishop are covering this, I find uh, d5 for him quite hard to accomplish. Uh, more so maybe in some positions, if he ever gets d5, potentially we could use an annoying bishop a3 idea, threatening b5 and then uh, the queen could be vulnerable. Uh, assuming he like castles, we could, uh, let's say, catch some big fish on that diagonal. Um, and f5, I mean, we just have uh, two bishops, uh, much uh, more space than our opponent. And uh, just imagine if he castles, 
We're gonna play g4. Just push the pawns. This rook immediately comes over. It's like we don't even have to develop pieces. Oh man, we're gonna have three heavy pieces uh, ready to checkmate the enemy king. But uh, yeah, honestly, I think you need to be kind of uh, crazy to go short castle here. I think specifically after somebody just plays f5, you know, it's just like uh, you have a random person that shows up in front of your door holding an axe. What are you going to do? Like open the door, say hello. Are you coming here for Halloween? No. I'm talking about specifically not Halloween times. And he goes there. Okay, interesting. Interesting. I'm just going to go g4 right away. Bishop g5, interesting to pin. Like, for instance, if he tries rook d to desperately go d5, maybe now this is uh, very sensible, just to make it harder for him to break. Uh, even though d5 still I can take, perhaps an idea for him could be e4 afterwards. So yeah, I'm going to go bishop g5, just a little bit of prophylaxis. Uh, kind of true that I could have gone g5, and uh, I'm sure that was very strong as well. I think both moves are good. I just wanted to get in a little bit of development. Uh, I think in hindsight, perhaps g5 was a little bit better, but uh, yeah, both are good. And b5, we can go en passant and then take, but I don't want to make it like a queenside battle. I want to still uh, very much utilize the same idea. So um, yeah, just do that. Notice that I'm delaying this knight because knight e2 will be kind of blockading rook's path. So the, the point is now after bishop g5, he can no longer do d5 because I have simple move. Not ed, because maybe e4 can get messy, but I'm literally going to take it with a bishop. So he cannot take now because of the pain. And uh, yeah, he goes knight b8. I'm going to go uh, rook to a2, just preparing to get the rook over. Uh, knight b8 is quite logical, uh, preparing to do this and get some protection. But uh, just look at all of these heavy pieces. Look how nicely we have uh, lined up the cannons. Man, imagine we literally have uh, like three very well-trained uh, snipers ready to exploit uh, any weakness of uh, our opponent. Uh, oh man, that is... Uh, actually, without exaggeration, I do believe uh, this is one of the nicest uh, kind of pictures that I've seen uh, in a while. Now, the only thing that I'm uh, kind of uh, bothered by is, can he actually push? Still, I don't think that should be a thing. I can very well uh, take and then go g5. Probably knight is forced to go back. Then g6 looks crashing. At least winning exchange. Oh, man. This is so juicy. I could also play uh, h4. I could literally push the pawn down the board and uh, probably be just fine with it. It's just that I'm giving him c6d5, so I want to act a little bit quick. So, how do we do this the precise way? Oh, we, we might even win with a queen checkmate. I mean, with a queen sack uh, and then a checkmate. So, I'm going to do g5. I just want to play quick, so not allowing him any counterplay with d5. Has to go knight back. And even though a move like g6, exploiting the fact that this is still pinned along the diagonal, like he can only take once and then we take... Then we take on f7, winning the exchange. I think it could be even better if we start with this. And then the idea is in case of g6, we could try to slide uh, the queen over. And then queen to h6, uh, get the famous little checkmating thing. Obviously, everything uh, wins at this point. Even a move like g6, pawn takes and then take it with a rook. Actually... Believe it or not, I think that's even easier. So I'm going to go g6. I just think we need to utilize uh, the activity of this bishop uh, most uh, as we can. And uh, please notice the difference between our bishop, because it looks very similarly placed to the enemy bishop. But our bishop has clear targets, and this bishop is just hitting in the desert. You know, it's like, uh, you know, bishop is uh, at work, but instead of being in front of the desk, he just goes for a cigarette break uh, nonstop. It's just... Not going to be very productive, uh, to say the least. Um, plus smoking is bad. So, g6. Okay. Now, the threat is on pawn takes. I have the greedy approach. Just take and then take the exchange. But do you really think we should give him uh, such an easy way out? Like, he barely has any moves. I think uh, 
we should better just go for the kill directly. So after pawn takes, I'm mainly considering taking with the rook. Okay, rook takes on g6. And that is creating an immediate threat of perhaps rook takes on g7. I haven't calculated that quite yet, but I think it uh, potentially works. And he plays a good move, knight f6. Here again, eyeballing uh, d5. Now I can take, he takes with the rook and he has a pin. Interesting. I can do queen g3. I think that's actually quite deadly. Queen g3, watch out. If pawn takes, we take with the queen, he cannot defend g7. And wow. Double threat of take and then checkmate. Good luck, good luck uh, stopping that buddy because uh, you're not going to be able to. And what is even more hilarious about this game? Look at the B1 knight. This is a happy knight, okay? And uh, he plays h6, okay, very logical. He's thinking, all right, I'm going to take. And my opponent is literally thinking uh, this, okay. It's maybe like a little bit uh, uncomfortable position. Now he's going to take with a bishop. I'm going to take and I'm going to defend checkmate, right? And I guess just survive. Um, but no, you don't have to take because when the rook is uh, pinned, this means uh, the rook is actually completely pointless. So you can immediately serve the checkmate. All right, voila, queen takes on g7. And we get a very nice mate and please... Watch out for the MVP of this game. Just look at this rook. Travel all the way from the A file in the opening to G2. Man. Imagine like your best friend is uh, living on a different continent and uh, you immediately need him for like your wedding or something that happens. Uh, I don't know. I just need you tomorrow or in a week. Yeah, it could be like a wedding. You think uh, weddings are uh, planned like uh, a year in advance? Well, uh, you've never been to a Romanian wedding. So uh, here, what pretty much made this possible is uh, the fact that throughout this whole time, we had uh, very good control over d5 because uh, whenever we are attacking on the side, Opponent should be looking for a counter strike in the center. If there is no uh, counter strike in the center, sorry to say, but he will usually have a very bad position. You know what? I take uh, the apologies back. And maybe that he has a bad position. So, uh, yeah, that is just uh, how you can go ahead and uh, try to squeeze this bishop to c5 to recap. Please do not fall for f takes on e5 because this is just like so trash. You're instantly resigning after queen h4, g3 and then queen e4. And as well, make sure to stay away from uh, taking the other pawn yet because of the same motive. And yeah, c3, preparing d4. And uh, after this, bishop g4, h3, uh, white is getting uh, quite nice play uh, with the bishop pair. So... Uh, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Right, everybody, managed to find uh, another white game. Gonna open up with uh, e4. And uh, hopefully, we're gonna be getting a uh, king's gambit. The opponent offers a draw. Wait, are you kidding me? Do you think we're gonna be accepting draws just like that? No. Let's see what uh, my opponent has in mind against uh, our little weapon. And okay. We are getting the most common move. We're getting the accepted variation. Normally, here black has a choice between takes. Most often it's takes. Bishop out. Maybe knight out. And uh, d5. And occasionally, they could sometimes just decline the gambit by playing d6. These are pretty much all the moves. And after takes, queen h4 uh, is a little bit of an annoying threat. Here white has uh, two main moves. You could do knight f3, which we are going to be playing. Additionally, bishop c4 is quite interesting because the check uh, allows king f1 and then the enemy queen is a bit misplaced. Mm. But for now, we're going to get started with this. If you want to see uh, three bishop c4, please let me know in the comment section. Now I'm just going to be playing uh, the standard move. And okay. The opponent maybe knows uh, his thing. He plays uh, d5. 
d5 is a pretty strong move because uh, well it's kind of like forcing me to take so that after queen takes i am going to be playing the move knight c3 simply developing uh, while gaining a tempo so knight c3 targeting the queen next up we're going to play d4 and we are going to be uh, winning back the uh, f5 pawn most likely he plays queen to h5 huh this is already no longer that standard. I could obviously play d4 and try to take, but additionally, because uh, his queen is there, I'm wondering uh, whether uh, we should start bishop e2, castle, and just sort of delay that for a little. I'm going to go d4. I want to see, is he actually going to try to keep the pawn with bishop d6? Maybe. Okay, here it is. Um, so, okay. I think I've got uh, two main ideas when uh, that happens. We could just uh, finish development, uh, get castled, and perhaps play for a discovery with knight e5. Or I could do knight b5 idea to take, win bishop pair, and then recapture. I think we're going for development here. No need to be so desperate about winning back the uh, f4 pawn. Just because uh, any kind of g5 type of idea is just uh, very slow. Like castle, g4, we don't care, like knight e5. I think uh, white is much better. I mean, with that, probably completely winning. So he goes queen to g6, targeting the pawn. Okay. Fine. Now, can we castle? I think his main argument is that perhaps bishop takes, uh, I mean, not takes, but bishop h3. Looks a little bit annoying. Is it though? I mean, at the very least, rook f2. It's a move. There's knight h4, there's knight e1 as well. I guess that could be perhaps a little bit annoying. Maybe we'll give him that. So additionally, yeah, what can I try? I don't think I can really try many things since castling is such a natural move that it kind of needs to be played. And uh, here we see the bishop landing. All right. How do we play this? I think knight h4 is a move that should not be underestimated. Like knight h4, queen g5. Hmm. Maybe a move even like uh, queen e1 could be very strong there. Uh, I'll explain in a second because queen g5, I'm considering knight e4, but then takes, I take, he takes. Wait, is the queen actually getting trapped? Wait a second. So I have something like takes, bishop g4, queen h6. Bishop takes on f4. I guess only square for the queen is g6. But then bishop h5. The queen has to move. I think that's huge trouble. I'm gonna go here. Notice how the knight nicely covers the mate. The knight uh, does move backwards. Occasionally, at least. <laughs> so, I'm gonna be doing this and... Uh, I think he's going to be taking, and I'm just going to be taking his bishop. And uh, I think he's in a very dangerous position. Just because even if he does not take what it seems to be the poison pawn on h3, I think we have a very big and annoying threat to play knight takes, followed by rook takes on f4 in that position. And his queen is uh, immediately getting under pressure. So going to take. Now, is he going to bite? That's the question. They always bite. But, uh, hey, I'm not afraid. I'm going to bite him back. So, uh, other than that, yeah, can't really come up with much of an alternative. And you want to really watch out for the move order. Because knight takes on d6 is vital simply because bishop g4, queen h6, knight takes on d6. Now his queen suddenly gets a square. So you got to do that, force him take back with a pawn. And then bishop to g4 becomes, uh, I think, quite problematic. Now, I have uh, mainly considered queen h6. Now, 
it could be perhaps more interesting for him to go queen to h4 just to not get uh, immediately targeted. So yeah, our main line that we calculated went queen h6, bishop f4, queen g6, and that. But on queen h4, an idea that I haven't mentioned, but it was there even in the past. Just imagine bishop to c8, and I have no idea how he's willing to defend that. I mean, queen to e7, loses the queen. Hello, rookie Johan. Uh, good morning, king and queen under the same uh, file. With an open file. And uh, HFC8, he most likely has to move the knight. It just looks very ugly, you know. Additionally, I can take with a rook. Which just kind of creates a threat immediately to discover. Uh, give a discovery check and then pick up the queen. If I take with a rook, he probably has to go back. But then we have a double attack. Queen f3. Wait a second. I feel like there is uh, there is huge potential. Just a huge potential. Yeah, I think I'm I'm taking with the rook. Taking with the bishop, it feels like you know you're also kind of developing at the same time. Honestly, this is a good move too, just because it's threatening to take. I'm just gonna keep it very casual. I'm not gonna be playing for cheap tricks. I think it's way more important to prioritize development. Like rook takes on f4 was perhaps leading to some fancy ideas, but uh I want to build up your chess foundation in a very solid uh, manner. You know, think of it as you're building a house. You know, you don't want to get your house destroyed the first time it uh, starts to rain. Especially if you live uh, in the UK. So, opponent plays the move knight to f6. Targeting the bishop. So the bishop is under attack. Now I could start uh, with a counter threat, queen e2, and he does uh, seem to be losing the right to castle. Pretty much losing uh, the right of having a normal life again after that move. Which, hey, as bad as it may sound, it looks very tempting. Do I want to do that? I could also give him a check with a rook. If I check him with a rook... Uh, Yet, king f8 allowing that, I think it's a disaster, so he mainly has to go to d8. And then I do still have to solve the issue of the bishop. The problem is that the queen comes there with a check always. So still kind of uh, considering my options. So I think... Perhaps starting bishop to c8? I mean, if he castles bishop to x on b7, that just gives us free exchange. I would like to somehow uh, combine uh, the best of uh, both worlds and uh, keep up the initiative. But I think we have to sort of uh, settle here on bishop c8. Yeah. I think, you know, important uh, to know when to slow down a little. Not to get uh, ultra greedy. It's time to finally cash in. You know, it's just like uh, in the stock market. Your stock is at an uh, all-time high. You may very well try to defend yourself uh, from a big crash. So we do that and he's forced to castle. If he was not castling, uh, allowing, uh, yet again, a check here followed by bishop b7. It's a disaster for him. So, yeah, just going to cash in, carry on with my life. I mean, we are winning pretty much a rook and a pawn for a piece, so what's not to like? Uh, I'm just going to take, because knight g4 is making absolutely no threat since hello. Bishop move backwards. Not only knights. So yeah. G5. <laughs> what a desperation sign. Yeah, we can take a moment for that. I'm just going to play bishop to g3. Slide back, hit the queen. Now, one of the very nice things about bishops is that compared to knights, bishops are long range pieces and look at the bishop. Look at this very nice retreating move. Targeting the queen, he can only go uh, there, but I'm gonna be like, okay. Hello, Mr. Knight. I noticed there's a little bit of a pain ongoing. I'm curious how he's gonna be defending against that move. Oh no, there's a fork, knight e3. Double attack. Well, that doesn't work, you dummy. I just mentioned it is a pin. So, f5. I could even take if I want to be fancy. 
but yeah, taking it's kind of fancy. I kind of like it. I'm just gonna go for it because why the fuck not? Uh, Rook takes on f5, hg, <laughs> little double attack, winning it all back. Okay, it's all about uh, getting those uh, trades and making the transition into the end game. With uh, two monster bishops, uh, just like that. Uh, obviously, my king is under uh, very good security. So, uh, nothing to really be afraid of. Uh, maybe only the fact that uh, I should uh, do is start to speed up a little. Only one minute left on the clock, but with uh, so many extra pieces, it should be a walk in the park to convert. And uh, yeah, opponent finds the resign button. We get a game. In case you're new to the channel and you made it this far into the video, now you have to really watch the best video that I ever recorded. It took more than 20 hours to film, and I'm sharing my experience for playing the Karokan in more than 8 years. So click the video from the screen, and I'll see you there.